Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining, and thanks, uh, Bethany, for reaching out to me to, to present this uh, program. I hope you'll enjoy. You know, uh, Comal County has such a rich history that uh, what I'm going to cover today just covers a small part, and um, uh, we, we do many things in the Historical Commission, but probably the most visible thing that we manage is the Historical Marker Program. Um, I'm the chairman of the Comal County Historical Commission, and I've been with the commission since 2013. And um, I have, I'm have i starting my third year as the chairman of the group. So <clears throat> we, um, we're a busy group. Even during the, the pandemic, we did manage to get some work done, and we have a lot of things on hold that we're anxious to get back to. So just briefly, the, to let you know what the Historical Commission is, um, we uh, assist with the preservation of historical and cultural resources. So this could be things like buildings, uh, archeological remains, um, uh, pioneer homes or old roads, structures, anything type like that. Even um, things like oral history. Uh, you know, we, we look out for those types of things in the county and do what we can to preserve them. We are appointed by the county judge, Judge Krause, and the commissioners uh, on a two-year uh, term. We were just appointed again in commissioner's court this year, so our terms will go through the end of next year. Uh, we currently have 20 people on the historical commission, and those are people that are from all areas of the county, so the county is very well represented. Uh, members need to have an interest in preservation and understand local history uh, and resources. There, preservation covers a wide range of uh, uh, regulations and laws, and so certainly our members are not experts on that. We rely on the Texas Historical Commission um, for you know many things that we don't understand, but people just have to really have a desire to be on the historical commission and uh, an, an interest in local history. Um, one of the things we do help with when we have people come to us and they want to um, apply for a histor uh, uh, historical marker, a lot of times we will help them research um, and also uh, prepare the application for submission to the Texas Historical Commission. And uh, we prevent, present presentations, much like what I'm doing today or other events that, that celebrate our uh, wonderful county and uh, educate people along the way. So like I said earlier, probably the most visible thing that we do is the historical marker program. So for our county, we, we manage that. We, um, we have guidelines from the Texas Historical Commission what has to be done. But for the county, um, we are the ones that administer that. Uh, and of course, the marker program covers all sorts of uh, topics in Texas history. And all of our counties actually have historical markers. And Comal County has 133. Every year we try to, um, we try to uh, get at least three to five more in the county. And so, you know, a lot of times we have people reach out to us, but sometimes we reach out also to property owners when we say, you know, you, you have a, a treasure here that we need to uh, work with you and, and try to get you a historical marker. So, um, we still have a lot of properties in the county that we believe um, are certainly worthy of markers. And uh, so we still have a lot of work ahead. There's different types of markers that you'll see around the county. And of course, these, the Texas historical uh, markers are the, the black markers with the silver lettering that you see on the side of the road. You may see them on a property, um, but there's different types. You have a subject marker, which would cover just a subject. For example, there, it may have been a location of a historic building uh, and, and a, a lot of history happened in a certain area. 
It could also be about a certain group. Um, we have cemetery markers and recorded Texas historic landmark, or what we call RTHL, are markers that are given to properties that uh, they have to be at least 50 years old and they have to be significant not only in the history, but also in the architecture of the property. And it pretty much has to be still intact of how it looked when it, when it first was uh, constructed. The process uh, for applying for uh, a historical marker, we tell uh, folks that about two years uh, before you, know, you start researching, you have, a only, you have a certain period during the year that you can uh, submit an application. And so it, the whole process, you know, plan on taking about two years from the time you start until you get your marker. Um, then we also have what's known as the Undertold Marker Program. And this is a program that covers underrepresented stories or groups of people. And every year, uh, the Texas Historical Commission opens up um, an application period where those can be submitted. And um, they actually, the Texas Historical Commission, Commission actually pays for that marker, whereas other historical markers are paid for by the sponsor of the marker. So when you see markers up at different locations, there would have been a person or even groups of people who wanted to get the marker and they pulled their money together to pay for those markers. And the, the cost of the uh, markers uh, run, a small marker is about $1,100 and the larger one's uh, $1,800. So they're pretty pricey. Okay, so the process uh, for getting a historical marker starts at the county level. That would be with the historical commission. And uh, we would have uh, a sponsor come to us, a property owner, whatever, and say that they want to start the process of getting a marker. And so we would help them with the application procedures, uh, advise them what the rules were on applying. It is a very, um, competitive um, process because you have 254 counties that are all submitting applications. Uh, I'm not saying every year everybody submits an application, but it gets to be very competitive. So, you know, there's some years that we will submit five. Um, some years we may only submit three, but there's other groups that are submitting them as well. So, and there's only, um, a period of time during the year that the applications are accepted. And um, we're in a uh, application period right now. The application period opened on the 15th of March and it will end on the 15th of May. And right now we have five that we um, hope to submit by that 15 May um, deadline. It requires a five to 10 page narrative. And um, we love it when property owners or sponsors are willing to take that on and write those. But if, if they're not, if they have all the history, but they're just not good at writing, we have some excellent uh, members on the commission who can help out with writing a, a narrative because you have to have uh, resources and you have to put footnotes. There's a lot of detail that has to be put into the application. Uh, where the marker is going to be placed, um, it requires the owner's permission and uh, also proof of ownership. So that has to be included as well. And then for that RTHL, which is the Recorded Texas Historic Landmark, um, because this is based upon not only the history of the property, but the architecture of the property, we also have to submit site and floor plans and a historic photo of the property back when it was, you know, an older photo, not just all um, uh, current photos. Um, so that one is a little more um, detailed and, and sometimes property owners don't have site or floor plans. And so, you know, we do have um, some people on the historical commission that are able to help out with that as well if they're not able to get those. 
So that's a little bit of the process. Um, and so what I pulled together here are just some of the historical markers in the county that you may or may not be aware of. And, and, uh, and hopefully it will spark a little interest for you to, to maybe get out and look at them. Um, all of our historical markers are listed on the Comal County Historical Commission website. And so if you haven't looked out there, I encourage you to do so because it will not only give you photos and locations, but it'll also give you the history that has been prepared and the narrative that was submitted for that, that uh, marker. So there's a lot of very interesting um, information out there. So the first one that's up here, this is located out at Canyon Lake Dam. And um, this marker actually was, uh, this is a replacement marker. It was stolen uh, from this location. It's uh, out on, uh, at the um, uh, dam there at Canyon Lake. And uh, for several years it was missing and there was a group of people who wanted to have it replaced. So they, they pulled their money and um, we, um, the marker was put in. Our historical commission helped with this one. It was quite a, quite a challenge because that's a pretty big stone. You can see that it was put on, but we had a group that went out and uh, they were able to, we got the stone donated and uh, the group bought the new marker and we had a little ceremony out there. It was very nice. So anyway, this one celebrates the German pioneers who were the first settlers in that area now that's um, covered by Canyon Lake. The next one here is, um, this is located out on uh, 2252. Um, at the Bracken United Methodist Church. So the, the Zion's Kirsha, Kirsha is, uh, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly. Uh, it means church in German. It was erected in uh, 1872. And then in 1893, 1890, 1893, they enlarged the, um, uh, the church there. This one is located on 311. Uh, this is called the Esther's Crossing at, at Wesson. And uh, it commemorates the importance of that river crossing, uh, which you know, contributed to the settlement of that area. They, they didn't have a, a, you know, a way to get across the river. And uh, eventually, you know, it, I mean, this is, was the lifeblood. This is what caused the communities to continue to grow and people to come in. So that's a very important uh, marker. This is a subject marker, uh, what I talked about earlier, because there's, there's really not a, um, a building or anything, but it tells a story. This is Riley's Tavern, which is uh, located out in Hunter. And uh, the building dates back to 1895. And, and this was interesting, the, the, the owner of Riley's Tavern, actually this was the first tavern to get a liquor license uh, after prohibition. And um, uh, this received a recorded Texas historic landmark. And then um, later we, uh, we applied to get this property listed in the National Register of Historic Places, which is a whole other process that I'm not gonna go into here, but it also gets a historical marker, but it's, it's not the same as a state marker. It's, it's the highest level that um, a, a property can receive at the national level. Um, so again, that's a whole other process, takes a couple of years on that one as well. So this one not only has, um, recorded Texas historic landmark, but it also has that national designation as well. Uh, this is the Knibby House that's located out on Spring Branch Road and, and Dietrich Knibby uh, is contributed to founding Spring Branch in 1852. 
And there's actually descendants who uh, they own and live in the property now. They have the big Kanibi Ranch uh, there. And uh, this property received the recorded Texas Historic Landmark um, designation in 2018. And so this house was built in 1910 and um, received the RTHL. So the house is just wonderful. I mean, it, it looks like it did back in 1910 when they built it and, and the, uh, the owners who are descendants of Dietrich, uh, they've done a beautiful job with the interior. So when, when someone comes to us and they want to reach out to the Texas Historical Commission and apply for an RTHL, the property has to be um, look like it did when it was constructed, not have any major, uh, you know, if you just do general maintenance type things, but if they had like put an awning on the front or done something to the side or something that had completely changed the outside of the building, it would, you know, it probably would not be approved for an RTHL uh, because they want it to look like it did when it was constructed. So this, this is a perfect example of that. It's a beautiful property. Uh, Fisher um, Historic District, we first, Fisher reached out to us and we helped them get the Agricultural Society of Fisher subject marker. And then the Fisher store received a recorded Texas Historic Landmark in 2016. Um, so the, um, and then later we applied to get that National Register designation. Uh, in 2017. So the whole Fisher uh, community is known as the Fisher Historic District. So it not only includes the Fisher store and the, the um, Fisher Community Center, the bowling alley, all of that it, that's in Fisher, but it also includes in the school, it includes the cemetery, it includes the homes that are in the Fisher Historic District and several outlying buildings that contribute to the historical uh, significance of the, um, the district. So this was a big, a big project. And uh, the picture there, those are two of our members. Um, actually, the lady on the right the, uh, uh, with the blonde hair there is um, Jerry P uh, Fisher Porter who is a descendant of, of the Fishers who developed um, the community of Fishers. So that was a special, a special time for her. And that's Sally Blacksmith, who's also one of our members. This is um, located in New Braunfels and it's on Comal Street and was the location of the New Braunfels Woolen Mill and Comal Steam Laundry. Um, you can see that old photo of, of the property when, when it existed and um, it's no longer there. There's very few um, signs of the, the steam laundry uh, being there, the woolen mills. The brick structure on the, on the right is, is part of that, uh, what's, what's remaining. So this is a subject marker. marker. There was not enough there, you know, we, um, the people who own the property are actually descendants of the, the family who ran the mill. And this subject marker was received in 2015. That large bell was actually used at the property. Um, we, we think probably to ring the bell, you know, for the workers, but also for the community if things were going on. And that was actually intact. The family had it and they had it, um, incorporated there with uh, next to the marker. And uh, it's just a beautiful area right there on the river. And um, the family was uh, so gracious to work with. They were so excited about recognizing their family. And um, uh, this was a, a, really, a really great project. Um, this is the Arnold Roush Brett Homestead. This is, um, you would not ever be able to see this because it's pretty far off the road, but this property was donated to the New Braunfels Conservation Society um, by the descendants of the, um, the Brandt family. And they have donated it um, 
I hopefully, I, I think the plans are for it to be like a educational um, um, property where they bring students out and they show them the way of life back in the day. And, but this property is just amazing. Um, the uh, structure there on the left, that was before a lot of work was done, but that is a barn. Um, and there were a lot of uh, farming implements and other things found in, in, the, um, in the barn when they did the, um, the renovations there. Uh, the house, you can see the old photo and a newer photo there. And then the, the two ladies were, the older lady was, um, was one of the property owners and that's the, the house um, back when, when she occupied the house. Um, it received a recorded Texas historic landmark in 2015, um, and then later uh, was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Conservation Society has held some fundraisers there um, for the past several years and had uh, music and food and um, silent auctions. It's, it's really a beautiful place. You can only get back there um, they they bust all of us back in a little bus and different things so it's it's not something that you could see from the road and uh, get easily get there easily um but it's it's a it's an amazing property and the conservation society did a beautiful job with restoring it and um it's it's just really amazing and on hall hall i'm sure that probably most of you or all of you have heard about on Halt Hall. Um, it received a subject marker back in um, 2014. And then in 2019, it was placed in the National Register of Historic Places. It's, it's a wonderful meeting place, um, a lot of history. Um, the inside of it is, is just absolutely amazing with um, with all of the wood and, um, you know, a beautiful wooden floor, great property. The Startsville community, uh, which is out on 2673. Um, so the uh, Heinrich and Louis Starts uh, settled the area in the 1850s. And uh, then of course the restaurant was added in 1963, which was, uh, is still there today or the cafe. Um, and this was a subject marker um, as well. This is another property that is on, it's on private property in the, um, the Spring Branch Post Office uh, out on Redmond Road. And it was in that location from 1867 to 1872. Um, and prior to that, it was on uh, Spring Branch Creek in 1858. And of course, post offices, uh, you know, provided communication to the outside world. They really were the hub of the community. Um, this is a, a very uh, neat property. There's, uh, it has, you know, there's still part of the uh, structure left there, but they've done some, some renovations to it. Uh, but it still has, um, it's just a beautiful location. It has a lot of um, uh, history there. This was a very recent marker uh, out on Mystic Shores subdivision, right at the entry there into their subdivision. This is for this 7-Eleven ranch. And um, it's recognizing um, the Nordens who they had uh, livestock and prize-winning livestock there and uh, ranching education programs, which were highly respected uh, couple in the state of Texas. And um, they, um, this area was developed by them. And so this is a subject marker that the property owners there at the 7-Eleven ranch, they had someone who spearheaded this, said, we need to get a marker in here. And um, so they all went together to get this marker there at their subdivision. They also just recently got another marker approved that's uh, for the Rebecca Creek um, 
uh, school that was in that area as well. So we'll, we'll be having another marker put up further into the subdivision there um, in the near future. This is located out on River Road and uh, this is the Jacobs Creek School Teacherage. And some of you may have not heard that term teacherage before, but it was actually a home that was built for the teachers teacher or teachers uh, that was either next to or nearby the school. And this was very common uh, back when they had, you know, one room schools in the area. And um, this is a beautiful property that was bought by uh, Bess Story and her husband. And they restored it. They did add on or add on to the property in the back. Um, and, but this is all intact. They did a beautiful job with the restoration. And uh, the property was given by Carl Pantermuel, who, uh, who was a teacher at the school. And um, so this property, Bess has died a couple of years ago. And um, we were very happy that, um, that we were able to work with her and get this marker uh, for the property. Uh, because she was in poor health and it really meant a lot to her. And uh, she was just really thrilled to be able to, to get this historic marker there in the, uh, at the property. And it's an RTHL. Kniper Chapel is um, near Bergheim. And um, this is a pretty old marker. It's been up there for a while. It got an RTHL back in eight, uh, 1983. And so the land was donated by um, Johan Kniper and uh, to help the residents there of Honey Creek uh, build a place of worship. And it was actually used until 1892 when the, when the St. Joseph Catholic Church was built. Shanetal School located out on uh, FM 3009 near uh, Garden Ridge, uh, got a marker. Um, this, this was a school that was built back in 1872 and it has fock work construction, which is, is a method of building, has cross timbers um, uh, construction. And uh, it was actually used for school until 1937. Now what you see there is, is an old photo of the school, but the property that has been incorporated actually into a home. So the home was built around it. So that means that there was no way of getting a recorded Texas historic landmark for that property. Um, so this is just a, um, a subject marker, really kind of a commemorative marker because um, you, if you were to go there, you really couldn't see um, any, any remaining um, resemblance of that property, what you see there. Um, we my husband and I just uh, probably within the last year uh, found this property. Um, we didn't even know it was there. <laughs> so uh, it was a nice little trip. You can actually see it from the road where it is there on 3009. This is the Sattler Post Office, which is on private property. Uh, it got an RTHL in 2002, and um, so um, this was uh, Wilhelm Sattler um, developed or had this home out in Comal County, and then he applied for, uh, with the good government to have, get mail service in Sattler, which he got in 1856. Uh, it was originally in the Sattler house, but then it was relocated um, um, to where it is now. And it's, it's has juniper logs and um, shinking, uh, caliche mud in the cabin. And uh, anyway, it's, it's really quite, uh, quite a spectacular place. Again, it, this one's on private property. Um, you know, we do have some in the county where the public cannot access them. They are on private property. So that's, you can you know look at them on our website uh, that I told you about and learn a little bit more about the history of the property as well. 
Um, this is located in Spring Branch Specs Crossing, which many of you may have heard of. Um, it was a low water crossing for the San Antonio Blanco Road. That's how uh, to reach uh, Spring Branch. So Hans von Speck uh, had a post office that overlooked the crossing there, and that's that's how it got its name, Specs Crossing. Um, and it was replaced um, with a bridge, new bridge in 1934. So this was a subject marker uh, as well. And it's, it's on the side of the road there near a um, uh, RV park. So also in the county, we have a lot of um, uh, cemetery markers. These are just a few that I chose to, to put up here that we've uh, helped um, the owners get. Usually it's uh, family members who have, um, they have family um, members buried at the cemetery. Um, and, or sometimes it's a group of people who have families buried in cemeteries and they will come to us uh, to help them get a cemetery marker. Before they get a marker, you also have to have the cemetery designated as a historic Texas cemetery. So that's a little process that takes a few months before you can apply for a marker. And a few years ago, um, we, uh, we set up upon looking at all of our markers in the county and decided that some of them needed to be restored. You know, over time, after they've been up for several years, they start to look faded or they've possibly had, you know, on the side of the road and they've had rocks fly up and hit them. Um, so since 2015, um, uh, John Coors, same last name as me, who is on the commission as well, um, he's our expert on restoring um, historical markers. And so him and his committee um, started out with refurbishing the markers in the county. So there was a survey done. We went around and looked and kind of prioritized which ones needed to be done first. So um, they've done 20 markers. And then um, we've helped the city also restore other types of markers that you see in the city. Like the city has their own historic marker for properties. And then um, other commemorative type markers, uh, the city has reached out to John and, and uh, he has restored those as well. So uh, they've done a lot, 20, 29 of those commemorative markers uh, over the last probably three years or so. So we're, pre we're pretty proud of, of uh, the markers and the way they look. There's still a few that we have to get to, but um, we go to other counties and we see the shape of some of their markers and we think we've done a really good job with, with restoring our markers. It's nice to be able to read them. <laughs> this one at the grotto is at the, um, the Catholic church in New Braunfels. And that one was in really bad shape. It, it looks good. And the one at Specs Crossing also was in very poor condition. So what we have ahead for the historical commission, we have um, we have six marker dedications. When uh, markers are approved and they are in, the marker sponsor gets the marker and installs them, they like to have a party, a celebration of some type, a dedication. So uh, we work with them on doing that. Uh, we did have three markers that were approved for 2020. So we'll have. Um, we're working on getting those um, markers received and installed. Um, we have three to five that we're working on right now that are going to be submitted for 2021. We may have a couple of those that may roll over to next year. Um, then we also have, uh, I talked a little bit about National Register. We have a lot of dedications uh, pending five of those as well. We're going to be busy once we, we get the go ahead to do some. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, figure out how to proceed uh, with COVID and um, we just wanna be sure that we're doing the right thing. And because we usually have big groups of people when we have these dedication ceremonies. Um, we're working on a national register project right now that should be completed um, this, this year sometime um, that will, um, 
get National Register designation uh, for the main plaza in New Braunfels. So we're looking forward, hopefully, hopefully that will be approved uh, sometime in May. Um, I did put our link there for the county website and we also have a Facebook page. Um, so please visit there if you're a Facebook person and um, we try to, to update and put things about the county and, and um, things of interest to the community. And I also put my email address and phone number there. Uh, you may be a property owner and would like to maybe think about getting a, a marker for your property or at least talk to uh, my me or we also have a marker chairman for the, for the uh, commission as well. 